Hello and welcome to our first Gower Society Youth Virtual Activity. Today we're going to take a spring stroll around a garden. Now if you're watching live on Facebook or if you're looking at the YouTube channel, then please comment at the bottom with any questions. Also, if you go to the Nature Days blog, you'll be able to see an identification guide for the plants that you will see in the garden today, but also one to help you if you want to identify anything in your garden that you see. We're going to be looking at the spring flowers that are just coming up, but also at the state of the trees and how to identify them now as they start to come out of their dormant period. So if you want to grab your ID guide and have a look, hopefully you'll learn what to identify in your grounds. We're going to start with the trees. And this is the first tree that you'll probably see coming into blossom. This is a blackthorn tree. Now to identify the blackthorn blossoms, you've got five little petals, all white, but quite rounded at the end. Now these are actually coming out of the stems and the bud, and you might find they're actually coming out of buds on the thorns themselves. Now their thorns are very distinct and can be up to about two and a half centimetres long and they really hurt, they're very spiky. If you look at the branch itself, the branches are quite dark, that's why it's called blackthorn. Now the leaves won't come out yet because they come out after the blossom, but the leaves are basically leaf shaped. We call them pinnate, but in fact they just look like normal leaves. Now this can be quite obviously confused with the hawthorn and we'll look at the hawthorn now to see how it differs. This is a hawthorn and it's looking very different to the blackthorn although in winter time they look very similar. If you see the thorns on the hawthorn they're much smaller than the blackthorn maybe up to a centimeter in length and if you have a look these little buds that are going to lead to where the leaves come out are right next to where the thorn is. They come out together and the leaves, when they come out, are definitely not leaf-shaped. I think they look more like small little Christmas trees. So once they're out, it's very obvious which one is which. You also have a bit of a redder or browner branches. And these can be quite dull when you get down to the stem themselves. Definitely not black and not shiny. They're quite dull along here. Now I've actually got a blackthorn that's actually in leaf at the moment. So if I take you back to that, you'll see how different the leaves are. So remember that leaf, like a Christmas tree, and then I'll show you the blackthorn leaf. So here's a blackthorn tree, which is in leaf. So these leaves, as I said, look like leaves. And you can see they've still got these big thorns on it. And the big thorns are much bigger than in the hawthorn. And they come out, these leaves along the thorny branches, not at the very end, like in the hawthorn. Now, if you come in the autumn time, it will look very different again because the blackthorn grows something called sloes, which are kind of bluey, yeah, kind of bluey, blacky fruits that you can make um, gin out of, or you can also turn them into lovely jelly. Hawthorn creates hawthorns, and these haws are actually quite red and very bright, very distinctly different. Next tree we've got here is a hazel. Now I've got a hazel hedge in my garden and you can see that the leaves are just starting to burst out of their buds. So if you see this weird shape at the end of your leaf, that's actually the bud that was holding onto the baby leaf over the winter. You can see it's just coming out. And it's a great time of year to have a really good look at these buds and how they actually manage to squeeze so many of those leaves into that tiny little bud. You can see the shape of them because they start to wrinkle when they come out first because they've been squished in and they start to spread out over the next few weeks. And you can see the hazel leaf is this perfectly round shape with this one sharp pointy bit at the very tip. And it's also got these tiny little serrated edges here, very distinct. But probably the easiest way to distinguish hazel is from its stem. So if I take you down here, you can see we've got a very straight stem here and my hedge I've actually laid it so the big stems you can see in the background like this one here this is like a tree trunk but I've cut it down but not got all the way through it and laid down the branches so that they're growing horizontally 
And hazel, like lots of the others, like the blackthorn and the hawthorn, will actually start sprouting out of the side branches of this laid one and grow into new sprouts going upwards. So you've got horizontal branches which are growing and then you've got the upright vertical branches which are growing. And then if you go up to the top here, you can see they're still growing as straight as they can. So hawthorn doesn't grow in a straight line. Hawthorn always grows quite jaggedy in lots of different directions. Hazel pretty much grows in these lovely, very straight stalls, which are really useful for making fence posts or making handles or even roofing and making walls and things like roundhouses. So very obvious straight stalls, but also the colour of them. This brown, very distinct brown colour will help identify our hazel branches as well. So hazel starting to sprout out now and of course from hazel we get our hazelnuts and that will be later on in the year in the autumn time. One tree that's leaf looks very similar to hazel is this one here but usually you don't find them in the same habitat in the same location because they like very different conditions. This one here is an older A-L-D-E-R and older trees are usually found in very wet soil. So it shouldn't be really in the same habitat as our hazel. But this older tree here has got these lovely round leaves like the hazel, but there's no spiky bit at the top. There's no point. They're perfectly round. And their bark again is different. They don't always create very straight stalls just like the hazel. They can be a slightly at an angle. And also they do have these lenticels, these white dots all over them, which you don't seem to find as much with the hazel, or it's not as many anyway. And alder is a very weird tree because it's the only deciduous tree, so that's the tree that loses its leaves in the winter time, that actually has cones as well. Cone trees or cone bearing trees, we usually call conifers. And as you know, conifers have got needles they don't have leaves anything like this so this is the only real deciduous tree that has these broad leaves that actually generates cones for their seeds but it's a bit early in the year yet for this for the cones and they don't look like pine cones they're much smaller but they do have that pine cone feature of having the tiny little seeds inside little cones another tree i've got here in my grounds in my garden is a horse chestnut tree. Now this look a bit droopy now because if you can imagine all of these little leaflets, this is one leaf, all of it together, and this is leaflets individual, all of these were squished together into quite a large sticky bud and that bud has burst open and all these leaves have come out and are starting to expand and grow. So that's why they're all drooping down. But once they're opened up properly, They'll all expand out and look like little fingers. And of course, the horse chestnut tree is where we get the horse chestnuts or conkers. Now, this is just a tiny little sapling, as we call them, a baby little tree that's growing out of the side of a much bigger one. So if I take you up to the top, you can see we've got a much bigger tree way up there, which is also opened. And a little bit later on, maybe in a few weeks' time, we should get some lovely blossom coming out of here as well to make some lovely, almost like chandeliers above your head. And we've got much more gnarled trunk here compared to the hazel or the alder or even the hawthorn. Huge old tree we've got here. Lovely. Other trees I've got growing in little odd places are these opportunistics. This is an opportunistic plant. This is a sycamore. Easy to identify because it's got this star-shaped leaf looking a bit like a maple and a very red branch that it attaches to the main branch to. So this is our leaf stalk. Now these will grow wherever they get the opportunity and they will grow quite big and quite fast. But we really don't want too many of these because they don't provide food for as many species as our native plants, like, such as all the other trees that I've mentioned so far. A very good plant for wildlife is this one here. This tree is one of the many willow trees. Now, if you look very carefully, you can see the willow tree's flower. Now, it doesn't look very colourful, 
And that's because unlike the hawthorn and the blackthorn flower, these are not relying on any pollinators to come to actually pollinate them. These are wind pollinated and the wind doesn't care what color your flower is, it will blow whatever. So these are trying to get the pollen from the male part of a tree onto the female part of a tree. Now the tree can be dioecious, which means it's got two different sexes. So you can have a male tree and a female tree, or it can be monoecious, which means that one tree has got both the male and the female parts. And they've both got to come out at the right time so that the, the pollen can reach the female parts so that they can make the seeds. So this is the female willow plant. When the male released its pollen from its catkins, so its flowers, it landed on this part of the female flower, which is called the stigma, and it's sticky. So the pollen landed on the sticky stigma, and then a pollen tube started to grow down this tube here. And then at the very bottom of this area here, this is the ovum, which is the egg part, the female part of the, of the willow. And then that joined with the pollen, and it started to develop into a baby seed. Now, while that's been developing into a seed there, up here, along here, it's been developing a parachute. And when this is ripe, and the seed is well enough to grow into a, a new plant, the outsides of this will burst open, and then the seed will start to want to be distributed somewhere away from its parents. Now, the way it does this is by the wind again, and that parachute will be caught up by the wind, and it'll be blown away with the seed dangling underneath it and taken away from its parents. And the reason it doesn't want to grow right underneath its mum plant is because they'll be basically having to share all the resources, the soil, the sun, and everything they both need to grow. So the young plants have to be distributed far away from the, the parents so that they don't have to fight over the resources. It just shows that this flower here is starting to create seeds now, so the willow seeds will fall onto the floor. And if you come back in about a month's time, you'll see a whole carpet of those little parachutes and it makes it look like it's snowing underneath the willow trees if you've got lots of them. And those will all turn into baby willow plants. Now this is gonna happen in the next month, so in about May, compared to the blackthorn and the hawthorn, whose flowers are only just coming out now, they're gonna turn into fruit in autumn time. So each tree comes into fruit and flower at different times so the, the little saplings, the tiny little tree plants, are all starting to grow at different times of the year. So they're not all fighting for light and all fighting for resources. And this brings us nicely into why we have spring plants. And we're going to find some spring flowers now and find out why they're growing now and not in the summer when it's much nicer and much sunnier to grow. Probably the most well-known of the spring flowers is the bluebell. And if you happen to have bluebells in your garden, or where you go for your daily walk, you can find out if they're the native or a Spanish variety or hybrid. Now the first way to find out is to look at the leaves. Now the leaves are these long straight ones. And if I give you a comparison in size, these ones are quite thin. They're about one centimetre across. That makes us think that they're probably native. But let's look at the other distinguishing features. If you look at the flowers, if you look at the end of the trumpet of the flowers, these are curling outwards. This is another feature that makes you think that this is a native, not a Spanish. The Spanish ones tend to splay out at the ends, so they don't curl over, they just come out and point out like that. Okay. The other thing about the flowers, if you look inside the anther, the male part of the flower which has got our pollen, will be cream. If we look, we got cream anther there, which again makes us think that it's a native. On a bluebell that's come from Spain, these will be the same colour as the flowers, so they'll be purpley or blue. The other thing we can look at is the form of the flower. So if we look on one side of our flower stalk, we've got most of our flowers on one side. So they're kind of asymmetrical, and that will make our flower, once they're all out, bend over towards one way, a bit droopy. That's another form of the native. Spanish ones have flowers on both sides of the stem and they tend to be more upright. So this one looks like we've got a native bluebell. Another spring flower that I've got in my garden, which you find in woodlands, 
is this amazing one here. This is an Aran plant or lords and ladies and it's actually rather poisonous but it's a beautiful one to have a look at. So if I show you the leaves first of all, these are arrow shaped and you can see they curl around the stem here yeah, or the leaf stalk and you can distinguish them from something else which is called sorrel that sometimes you see in the woods because it's got a vein running around the outside and this is more curled and in sorrel this is a very straight triangle here and of course the flowers are very distinctive when they first come out they grow in this amazing folded up system here so this is the outside of the flower this hood which wraps around our anther here so this flower here is meant to look like a lady in an Edward, in Edwardian clothes so this is a bit like think about the Queen Elizabeth that ruff that she had around her neck that's what this bit's meant to be like and this is her head now later on in the year when we get down to where the seeds are going to grow down the bottom here in the ovum now these are going to develop into bright red berries and it's going to be on the stalk here bright yeah, red berries lots of them in pairs or in fours all the way along this stem here now those are very poisonous and because quite often this plant is surrounded by other things that you might want to pick to make some spring uh, food for example wild garlic Although these leaves look nothing like wild garlic, wild garlic doesn't have this arrow shape and it's very round, uh, very straight. I haven't got any to show you, I'm afraid. They don't grow in my garden. But if you happen to have them growing in the same place and you just pulled the leaves and you mix them together without sorting them, then it could get you into trouble. But these red seeds and red fruits that you find later in the year are very distinctive and very obvious and should be avoided at all times because they are deadly poison poisonous but this is a beautiful flower to check out anyway the lords and ladies flower is also meant to smell like we so that it attracts flies this is a rhododendron it's looking a bit sickly because rhododendrons don't really lose their leaves in the winter time so they've been there for over a year but if you have a look in the middle you can start to see the start of a bud because we'll soon next month or so get some beautiful rhododendron flowers coming out and you can see this bud starting to develop some huge beautiful bright pink flowers slightly later on so if you've got something that you know will flower this is a great opportunity to keep watching it and seeing how those buds open up and see what happens to the old leaves and see if it develops new leaves before or after the flowers you can also use what's happening in spring in your garden to check out some old wives' tales. Now this is an ash and we can see it's an ash because if you look at the buds they're nice and black, very easy to identify. And the old wives' tale says that if the ash opens before the oak then the summer is going to be a soak. So if I had some oak in my garden, which unfortunately I don't, and it hadn't opened yet, this was telling us that we are going to have a soaking wet summer. However, if we had some oak and it opened before the ash, then the old wife tale says that we're going to have a splash, which means we're going to have a dry summer. Now, fingers crossed, if you look in your garden, hopefully your oak has been out for a lot longer than this ash has, and we're going to have a lovely summer. But if the oak isn't out yet, and my ash is, then unfortunately we're going to have a very wet summer. But it's good to test it out because once you've had a look at those and seen which one is open first, you can predict what's going to happen. Then look at the forecast, look at what the weather's like in the summer and we can see if it's true. Some of the other plants you can eat in my garden are this Alexander here. Alexanders are in the family of the umber feathers, which when they develop flowers, they're tiny little white ones that make the shape of an umbrella. Unfortunately, the umberfillers have got some very poisonous members in their family, including hemlock and water dropwort, as well as the giant hogweed. So you have to be a 100% sure before you even think about starting to eat them. But these alexanders, when they've grown a bit taller, you can get their stems and peel the outside because they're a bit hairy, and then you can eat them like celery. And they're meant to taste very similar to celery. 
If you find one that's got this form and the leaves are bigger and they start to grow bigger than your head, giant hogweed it might be. And these ones, even if you break the stem and you get it on your skin, you expose that to the sunlight, you can start to get nasty blisters. So do be very careful when you're looking at the umbrophilas. The water dropwort, this leaf, imagine if I got scissors and started cutting it into lots of little leaflets, a bit like the fern. The water dropwort's like that. It's also found next to water courses. And hemlock is the same. Lots and lots of tiny divided little leaves, but in this kind of form of these three leaflets. So if you're not sure, look it up. And that might be an interesting task for you to do anyway when you've got some time, is to create your own identification guide for the flowers and plants in your garden. You can always use it another time of the year to find out what things look like at different seasons. If we carry on with the foraging theme, I've got some burdock in my garden. So this is burdock, very big leaves. And this burdock can be eaten. You've got to be sure though it's the first year. If it's the second year, if you had it before, you've probably got some old stilks like this. And that means that it's had the burrs. And the burrs is the seeds. And those are what we yet get Velcro from. And if it's got those seeds, you won't find any food because it's used all of its energy to create the seeds. However, if it's the first year, which this plant is, because it's in a different spot to last year's, you can go down to the roots and dig down and try and pull up the plant whole. Try not to break the big um, tap root. Dig right down, pull it up, and you'll get a very long root that looks a bit like a parsnip. And if you scrub that or peel it and then fry it, it is absolutely gorgeous. And you can't really confuse this with any other plants. So if you've got this growing in your garden, have a go. It's a bit of hard work digging it up, but you will find a beautiful plant down there. Also in the grass here on our lawn, we've got the proper creeping buttercup. So this, unlike the lesser celandine, which was a buttercup in the buttercup family, this creeping buttercup has not got any flowers yet because it's not really a spring flower, it's a summer flower. So we can keep an eye on this and we know that we'll get some lovely yellow buttercups a bit later in the year. Last one we're going to look at for food, of course, is the stinging nettle. And I've got a whole YouTube video on how to make stinging nettle soup if you want to have a look at that. But if you want to keep a bit of stinging nettles growing in your garden, it's a really good idea for wildlife. Loads of caterpillars love eating stinging nettles. So that's it. That's a spring stroll around my garden. So I hope you enjoyed learning about the different plants that are in my garden and I hope you can use it to look at the plants in your garden. The last thing I want to show you before we go, if you have a look above my head, you'll be able to see I've actually got a nest in my garden as well. So this is a tiny little sparrow's nest, a house sparrow's nest. And every time I come out my back door, which is just there, the sparrows fly away. And every time I go back in, I'm sure they all come back. So if you do happen to have a nest box or want to make one, I'm going to be creating a blog on how to make a nest box soon. But if you want to have a look around your garden, see if you can see any birds nestings. But don't disturb them, just watch them from a distance and see if you can see how many times they have to go back to feed their chicks and watch to see if you can see them fledge or just carefully listen up for any of those tiny little babies inside the nest. Good luck and I hope to see you again at another Gauss Society Youth experience.